My phone dinged again and again, vibrating almost violently in my pocket. Without looking at it, I flick the button on my phone's side to shut it to silent. I continued on, explaining how documentation assessment worked to the newbies who'd been dropped off to me that morning from HR. The group looked interested in what I was saying and chuckled as I retold a story about a client saying he wore his savings on his wrist, the photo he was going to send me of his watch to prove he had money. Then all at once, something was wrong. The back of my neck was suddenly drenched in cold sweat and my palms were prickling. I let out a shaky breath and one of the group asked if I was okay. I nodded and then heard a knock on the boardroom door. One of the floor managers walked in. Her face looked stern and I felt my stomach starting to flip. Guys, I need to grab Lily about something. Can you take a break downstairs in the kitchen? I'll come get you once we're done so you can finish your induction. They all nodded and made their way out of the boardroom, happy to have a break so early on their first day. Amy, what's going on? She bit her lip and took a seat, motioning for me to do the same. I complied. My knees felt like they were going to buckle from the anticipation of whatever she had to say. There was a silence, and in that silence, I'm pretty sure my heartbeat was audible. Amy and I were friends, really good friends, and I could tell that something was really wrong. Her eyes were glassed over, and she kept fidgeting with the ring she was wearing. Lily, something's happened, and you may need to go home. I felt my eyes narrow at her. Go home? I was the only training manager the office had. There was no way I'd be given the okay to go home un unless... Who died? <laughs> I asked with a weak laugh. I... I don't think I can answer that right now, but... Amy moved closer towards me, now taking a seat right beside me. She placed her hand over one of mine. Alex is missing. One of his friends found me on Facebook and messaged me. No one's heard from him in five days. His parents wanted your number. They wanted to speak to you, see if you knew anything. My response to this was to move over to the small bin we had in the corner and vomit. Amy rubbed my back as I cried and dry heaved for what felt like forever. The rest of the day was a fog. Amy drove me home and I sat on my sofa curled up in a ball covered in blankets. I didn't realize how long I'd been there, feeling sorry for myself, until I heard my front door open. My dog barely reacted, instead choosing to push his wet snout into my face. Lily, are you okay? I sat up and Amy looked at me with concern. Have you eaten? No. Amy stroked the side of my face for a moment. Well, let me make something up for you and Maybe you can run yourself a bath. I nodded and padded into my bathroom, closing the door behind me. I watched the bath fill with hot water, feeling numb. Alex couldn't be missing. I was going to have a hot bath, come out, and see Amy cuddling my dog and explaining it was all an elaborate prank. Yes, that would be all. Everything would be fine. I lowered myself into the water, hoping the scalding heat would wash the day away. I leaned over the tub to fish my phone out of my jeans pocket. I stared at the screen, at the uncountable notifications. Alex's friends had been desperate to contact me all day. Why would I know where he was? Didn't they know? Alex was my best friend, but for the last four months, he hadn't spoken to me. Apparently some girls really don't let their boyfriends have close female friendships. I scrolled through all the messages on my phone. At first, everyone thought Alex was on a fishing or camping trip. Then his roommate snuck into his room to steal from his badly hidden weed stash to realize all of his stuff was there. Every single fishing rod, rucksack, and piece of camping gear was in its usual place, untouched and gathering dust. I scrolled through the notifications on my phone, seeing the countless messages from Alex's friend Peter. A few from his brother, but only one message stood out. A message from a name I didn't recognize. Neville Seam. I clicked the Facebook message and felt confusion bubbling in my stomach. He played a game and he lost. But I think we can get him back. Give me a call on... Redacted. A game? 
What? What damn game? I could barely beat Alex at friggin' Mario Kart. What game could he have lost? I heard Amy humming around in my kitchen, and for a moment considered asking her to call the number with me. But then I remembered how Amy was a rational human being. Even in the state I was in, I was still slightly surprised that she hadn't scolded me for leaving my front door unlocked for her to just waltz in. Me calling a strange number to get information about Alex? No, she'd probably rightfully tell me not to do that, because it is an insane thing to do. I took a steady breath and called the number. On the third ring, the phone was answered, and a disembodied voice began speaking to me. It had an unbearable twang, as if the owner had just finished smoking 20 cigarettes straight, and then ran a marathon, and it was ambiguous enough that I couldn't be sure if it was a man or a woman. Lily, the voice croaked. Neville? My voice sounded small as I spoke, and I pulled my knees to my chest. The bathwater suddenly felt like ice on my skin. I can give you a clue, but I have some rules. Rules? A crackle like static burst into my ear, and then the voice spoke again. Tell no one. He might not make it back if you do. What type of sick joke is this? I snapped. It's about as funny as making a date out of the boot of a car and wearing his jacket. I froze up. How did the voice know? Or maybe it's as funny as holding his hand to steady yourself whilst walking on a beach. My throat was dry. Whoever this was knew things that Alex and I had certainly kept secret. Okay, let's go. Answer me this question, and I'll tell you where to find your second clue. You haven't even given me the first clue. The voice laughed, and it was a high screech. I winced. If you get the correct answer, you'll have the first clue. Message me the answer. Only one attempt. 24 hours. Okay. Go ahead, then. My name is the game. The line went dead, and I heard Amy telling me to hurry the hell up. I threw my phone onto the clothes I'd left piled on the floor and finished my bath. Once I emerged dry and cloaked with a dressing gown, Amy was stood smiling with a bowl of tuna pasta in her hand. I nodded and took the bowl from her. We sat in my sitting room and ate in silence. Work said they understand if you need time away, and that you still have a hell of a lot of personal days to take, so to just give us a heads up when you can. Thank you, Amy. So, have you heard from him or responded to his friends yet? They told me they'd tried reaching you. I shook my head. I'm not ready for that yet. I'm trying to get my head around it. Alex wouldn't just run off. At least not without telling me. Listen, I have to go, but are you going to be okay? Because I can go grab some stuff and stay over. Don't worry. I kind of want to be alone. Amy nodded, squeezed my hand, and left. As soon as I heard the door close, I pulled out my phone staring at the Neville Seam profile that had messaged me. He had no posts, his profile photo was of a road, and his profile photo was of a road. I went upstairs, his phone still clasped in hand, and pulled my MacBook out from under my pillow, and my journal from the top of my dresser. I flicked to the next empty page, and wrote out the name, and then rearranged the letters. Eleven miles. I searched for it on Google, and the search bar lit up with results all the posts detailing the rules of the game, a game I remembered me and Alex talking about during one of our regular car rides. Lily, that sounds even more fake than the elevator thing you told me about. Alex, babe, this might be legit. He let out an exhale of smoke from his mouth in response and shook his head. See, with all those other bogus rituals, there's, a, there's like a million stories with experiences. There is nothing about the 11 miles game. Whatever, Lil. But it made no sense. Alex always teased me for believing in paranormal stuff, and rolled his eyes whenever I gushed at a new horror release. I took a deep breath as I googled the rules and messaged Neville Seams. 11 miles. My phone buzzed immediately. Bingo. Pack a big bag. Location drop coming your way. I put my phone down and read up on the rules. A vehicle, car is the most common choice. A desire, a wish. 
It must be conducted at night, on a road not well traveled. Drive to the woods. The road you take must pass through them. Whilst driving, enter the woods. Look carefully, your wish will guide you. You'll know the road when it appears. Once you know you found the road, turn down it. Now it's time to understand the importance of miles. Take a break now if you need to. This is the last chance you have. Mile one drive. It's gonna start getting cold. Maybe you should turn on the heat. Mile two drive. Now you should turn on the heat. If not, you'll regret it. Mile three drive. Those shadows might look human, but ignore them. It's not how it seems. Mile four drive. The voices aren't human. Ignore them. Mile five drive. Ignore the trees vanishing and that lake in the glow of the moon. Ignore them. It's not how it seems. Mile six drive. The trees have returned, but the stars are gone. Your headlights have started to flicker. Ignore it. The radio is turned on now, but ignore it. Do not turn it off. It's not how it seems. Mile seven drive. The voices are back. They sound closer now. Do not turn around. Do not look at your back seat. It's not how it seems. Mile eight drive. Slow down, but do not stop. Your headlights might flicker. If they do, you can break, but do not stop. No matter how cold it gets, no matter who or what you see, do not stop. It's not how it seems. Mile nine drive. Your vehicle may stall. Close your eyes, attempt to restart it, but do not open your eyes. Whatever you think you hear, do not open your eyes. When your vehicle starts up again, drive as fast as you can. When the mile is over, open your eyes. But remember, it's not what it seems. Mile 10 drive. Do not look in your rear view mirror. Mile 11 drive. Your vehicle may lose power, but it will still move. Let it. If you see a red light ahead, close your eyes. Close them tightly. Cover your ears if you can. Do not open your eyes. Do not listen. Cover your ears. No matter what you hear, no matter what you feel, no matter how hot it gets, do not look. Whenever your vehicle gets its power back, open your eyes, take a breath, and drive. I lit a cigarette, feeling the stress building up. This wasn't real. This couldn't be it. It didn't make any sense. All you gotta do is play the same game. Winning a game is not that hard. Well, for Alex it was. I looked back at the screen. There was even more information, even more rules. Now drive until the road ends. Stop, close your eyes. What's the desire? What's your wish? Picture you possessing it, even if it changed during the journey. Open your eyes. If you wanted an object, check the trunk. If it was non-material, return to your life. Be patient. It'll be there. You may now find yourself at the beginning of the road. You can start again or go home. During your journey, don't turn on the radio. Use your phone. Open the windows. Drive faster than 30 miles per hour. Leave the car. Keep your eyes on the road. You can pick one rule to break, but you must pick it now. I want to be able to use my phone on the condition you don't call for help, but if you do, there will be consequences. Deal. So now I've got a bag packed. My sister on her way to house sit. Luckily, she's never been one to question my erratic behavior and my GPS ready for an 11 mile journey. I'm coming for you, Alex. I'm coming for you. You just hang in there for me. I did it. I won. But I wished I never played this stupid game. I don't want to think about this ever again. I think you'll realize why. Some things shouldn't be tested or explored. And sometimes when you lose something, it's best for it to stay gone. I love you, Alex. I let my car roll to a halt. I was at the location drop Neville had sent. I still couldn't tell you where he sent me. Somewhere out a countryside I'd never seen. Since my last post, I read through so many of your comments and I looked further into the rules of this game. 
A lot of stuff contradicts itself, but the parts of the rules that never seem to change is the stuff about keeping your eyes closed and ignoring sounds. I looked at my passenger side seat and at the pile of supplies I had ready. A thick knitted cardigan, it's supposed to get cold, right? A notebook with the rules. A large box of food and several large bottles of water. I also had a trusty flask of tea. I debated knocking the mirrors out of my car, but from some deep digging I realized that wasn't the best idea. I left a note in my makeup room. With my sister house-sitting, it'll be the first place she'll raid. I've left clear instructions. It's good that I enjoy storytelling. What do you mean? You broke a rule, but I suppose it's a fun post. Isn't too big of a party foul. Where's the road? You've studied this game now. You know how it works. Keep driving. Another thing. You broke a rule by letting people know, so how about I add one? I felt my jaw start to tremble. My palms felt like I'd just pushed them onto a cactus. I was going to do this. I was going to do this. Do you want to see Alex? Do you? Lily? Give me your rule. I let you have your phone, so I'll keep you company. If I call, you answer. I even promise not to call when you're not supposed to listen. Remember that, though. I won't call unless I can. Now start driving. So I did as I was told, and I started driving. The rest of this isn't going to be as coherent, and I'm sorry. I tried. I cannot tell you how hard I tried. Finding the road. I kept going, letting my car go slow. The last thing I wanted to do was run my tank dry and freeze. You'll know when you find the road. You'll know. I kept driving forward in a straight line, keeping my eyes on the road ahead, but I knew it wasn't my road yet. Two minutes turned to ten, then to twenty, and then I felt it. It was like the blood was rushing out from behind my legs. I felt a hollowness in me. I had to stop myself from holding my stomach. It was like all my insides had fallen out and I needed to push them back in, but I refrained and it was because of this restraint I was rewarded. The sides of the road that were once dark were filled with the most beautiful sunflowers I'd ever seen. Everything was such a brilliance of yellow. I could have sworn to you it was a hot summer morning. I could feel the glow in my stomach, in my heart. I was golden. Then I watched as they died. I watched every single petal wither. There was no more gold. Darkness took over once more, and the sides of the road didn't seem to matter anymore. I kept my eyes back to looking front and center. I knew my desire. I wanted Alex. I wanted him safe, alive, and I wanted him back. Mile 1. Drive. All you got to do is drive. Keep the windows up, keep the radio off, and get prepared for the temperature drop. I reached over to grab my cardigan, and I wrapped it around my body. From the death of the gold glow, silver sprouted. Wow, they weren't kidding about that star thing. For a moment, I felt myself feel the awe. They were so beautiful, the most beautiful things I'd ever seen. Thump. My heart was in my throat. My instincts kicked in as I took control of the wheel. I'd hit something. I'd been thrown off course, but not fully. I regained control. It was fine. I was fine. I was cold. I was so cold. My phone jingled, and I pressed answer and then speaker. Thank goodness for a console mount. Talking hands-free on this road was probably for the best. It was a call from Neville, because of course it was. You're entertaining. The voice was like a static-filled slither. How is that possible? Lily, can you hear me? I clenched my jaw hard enough to make my teeth ache. What makes me so entertaining? Sunflowers. Ice water. I was in ice water. I looked down, my feet were covered in water and it was rising, quickly. I kept my eyes on the road. I couldn't afford to keep looking away. Soon I wouldn't have the option. Neville's voice was a giggle, but it wasn't distorted. It was a child's laugh. It sounded like my sister's when we were kids. 
My knees, the water was at my knees. My toes were numbing, cold enough to burn. You have a desire for love. A desire for Alex. Predictable. He sighed theatrically. But at least it wasn't roses. The static slither was back. The water was at my stomach. It was so cold. Enjoyed your first mile. The voice was teasing me now. Forgot to mention, time isn't really what it seems. The line went dead, and I was dry. Bone dry. Mile two. I'd driven a mile. I knew I had. I knew. But it'd been an hour. A whole hour. It's not what it seems. I took a swig from my flask. The tea was still hot, and it scorched my throat. I let the heat sit for a moment before swallowing, but then I was back to feeling the cold. From the corner of my eye, I knew there were trees in each side of me, creating a tunnel into who knows where, but I tried my best not to pay attention. My car bumped, tarmac seamlessly melting into a dirt road. It was getting bumpy now. Keep breathing. Keep steady. Nine more to go. Sunflowers. My hand twitched. Turn back. F feel golden. It was warm there. They died. It took me a few seconds to realize it was my own voice. I bit down on my lip. I didn't want to speak. Something deep in my bones was screaming at me to keep my mouth shut. It didn't matter that the sunflowers were dead. I was never golden. Mile 3 The bumps in the road were harsher now. Every couple of feet, my entire car shook, but it didn't matter. This was going to be a long mile, as was the next. I just knew. It was going to be longer. This wasn't a normal road, but I knew that beforehand. Not everything, as it seems. As soon as someone says, don't look, that's pretty much all you want to do, right? Keeping my head strained forward was painful. Then I could see it. A red string. It was tying itself tighter and tighter around my nape. It was cutting through my flesh. I could feel myself starting to gargle. I could see it without looking at it. I didn't need to check my mirrors. I knew the string was there. I knew my bones were starting to burst through my skin. I could feel the popping. It was bursting. I was bursting. If I could twist myself just right, I could yank the string off. But the mere thought of it made my jaw swing open. Metal. Blood's an undeniable smell, isn't it? It was dripping out in what could only be gallons from my mouth. The copper-rusted taste clung to my teeth. Alex. You've got to get Alex. There wasn't trees outside anymore. I coughed. My windshield was colored red. I smiled. At least I couldn't see the shadows. I couldn't see them running toward the hood of my car. I couldn't see. It doesn't matter if the road turns golden again, I thought. Everything is red, crippling crimson. My phone rang again, but instead of my usual ringtone, it was a foghorn. The string snapped. The windshield was clear and I gasped. It felt like glass was scraping my throat, but I could breathe. My face was wet. I was sobbing. It was guttural. I was screaming in an audible noise. It felt like my face would crack. It was like waves. I was crashing. I was going to crash the car. The phone rang and I hit the answer button whilst trying to regain control of the car. I couldn't keep messing up. I had to keep going. I had to keep going. You've got it, Lil. A glutton for punishment. Take a breath and enjoy the silence. The line went dead again, and I took deep gulps of air over and over again. I punched the dashboard with my left hand over and over again until I heard something. No! I hit the roof of my car. My hand felt mangled, but it didn't matter. I'm not listening. I am not listening. Keep shouting. Keep going. Drown it out. Welcome to mile four. Mile four. Carry on, my wayward son. It felt like the roof of my mouth was splitting open as I sang louder than I had in my life. For there'll be peace when you are done. Are you sure? Lay your weary head to rest. The voices continued. 
they weren't human. No matter how convincing they sound, they're not human. The words were stuttering. They sounded as if they were trying to break through an old radio broadcast. You'll get Alex back like this? Don't you cry no more! Come on, Lily. You can do better. I hit my head on the wheel before shrieking another line. Once I rose above the noise and confusion. Stupid girl. <laughs> it's coming. And then nothing. I hollered aloud, laughing in a hysteric pitch. A moment of panic in Kansas saved the damn day. Woo! I kept driving, right on to the next mile. They were getting shorter, but this was a game. The clearing was going to be the eye of the storm. Mile 5 I glanced out the window. There were no trees. There would be a clearing now and a moon. A big moon, glowing down on me that I couldn't look at. Tear out your eyes. I shook my head and the thought went away. I was close. I was going to get through this. Some rules said the clearing would have a lake, sometimes on the right and sometimes on the left. I couldn't drive through it. That was important. I just needed to keep driving straight and ignore the moon. When the moon hits your eye... I was laughing again, almost buckled in joy. I didn't need to look at the moon to know what was there. I was in the clearing now. It seemed endless. A vast road of what looked like snow, illuminated by the washes of moon blast from above. The moon was there. I didn't care. I didn't need the moon. I needed Alex. Then it was gold. Everything around me was a golden glow. Ha! <laughs> I scoffed. You're screwing with me. But I can almost feel the string wrapping back around my neck, this time pulling down from the base of my skull, as if trying to make me snap my head up. I knew what the string wanted. I knew what this damn game wanted. But I wasn't going to take even the smallest look. I took another swig of tea. It was still hot. The night was glowing and I could feel myself breaking down. My mind was cracking open, but it didn't matter. If I have to go crazy to get you, Alex, I will. I'll do it. And then I saw it. Not the moon. Not the shadows. But a man fishing in the lake. He was wearing Alex's coat. It's not him. Keep driving. Stars began to twinkle. I watched as their reflections bounced in the lake. I was getting close, mile six, pretty much halfway. I kept driving. Looking back, I wish I drove the damn thing into the lake. That's all I can manage to retell for now. There'll be the final of everything tomorrow. But I'm telling you right now, I don't think I ever got off this road. Promise me you will never, ever play this game. Learn from these mistakes. I want to thank you guys for supporting me on this journey. Thank you for reading through the bumbling attempts at storytelling, and apologies for this, our finale. It was hard to write this down coherently, and my crippling dyslexia and exhaustion wasn't much help, but I hope, my lord above, I hope you guys can learn from this. This is not a game. Never play this game. No matter who is at stake, no matter what is going on, no matter who is gone, it is not what it seems. Mile 6 The stars began to fade, and soon the moon was no longer pouring out an insatiable glowing light. It was dark, and I felt comfort. The trees seemed to grow before my eyes, trunks towering so far above I couldn't fathom their height. Your headlights will start to flicker. Your radio will turn on. The rules repeated themselves over and over, but still it was dark and silent. Was Neville giving me a break? Or was this time to repent? Time to leave? Time to go mad? I let my mind empty. If there was silence, and darkness and warmth, I was going to enjoy it. I checked the time on my phone and saw that I'd been driving for almost eight hours. Not possible, but this road would never end. I knew that. The temperature became hot, 
Unbearably so, but I kept my cardigan wrapped around me tightly. I would not be fooled. Suddenly, in the overbearingly dark night, my headlights began to flicker. But that's not why my heart skipped a beat. The radio was on. I felt pins and needles all over my body. I kept driving and imagined hauling my car into a nearby tree to end it all. No matter what happened, I knew I had to keep going forward. I had to reach Alex. He's been waiting for you, Lily. Not long now. My knuckles felt like they were tearing apart. I kept on moving, but the road was getting narrower. The heat was reaching a fever pitch. Sweat was pouring from every part of my skin. My hair was sticking to my face. I reached up to move it, but jerked my hand away instead. My hair was moving, slinking its way into my nostrils. He loved the idea of you, Lily. He never loved you. The hair started to tangle behind my eyes. I could feel each strand stretching behind my eyelids. It felt like small but vicious hands were stabbing me, burying themselves deeper and deeper into my eyes. I could see them, tiny little lines in my vision, obscuring the journey ahead. It's in your head. All of this is in your head. The voice was muffled and feminine, and then I realized it was my own. That's when the ringing started. I kept one hand on the wheel and reached up. A loose strand of hair was floating out of my eardrum. The pressure started to build up. It was as if someone was pumping a balloon up inside each of my ears. Lily, do you think you can carry on? Sing another song. The balloons felt bigger now, and it felt as if nails were pushing into my skull. But I was going to see. No, I wasn't going to see anyone at the next mile. I wouldn't see anyone real on this road, at any mile, at any point. A sharp-pitched ringing burst through the radio, and suddenly it was Neville's voice I heard. Each letter seemed to hiss out at me. Oh, Lily, you are really so very predictable. The sensation changed under my skin and in my head. Something was moving, pulling parts of my insides in directions I didn't know possible. I sneezed, feeling something dislodge under my lap. Eight-legged freaks. Ha! <laughs> Every single muscle tensed. Every single cell of my being wanted to slam on the brakes. But I was wrong. It wasn't hair in my ears. It was spiders. Behind my eyes, in my nose, and scuttling out of my ears, I had spiders burrowing inside of me. There's no way to win. Not a hope in hell. Mile 7 I turned the radio off for you. The voice was behind me, loud and chirpy. I could still feel the spiders climbing onto my arms, sliding into the sweat covering my skin. Don't turn around. I felt a cool hand rest on my shoulder from behind. It was almost comforting to have release from the heat. In a moment of crazed bliss, I almost let my head roll back, but I stopped myself. Four more miles. Four more miles until this hellish game was over. Do you think we could pull over? I'm feeling a little sick back here. The hand tightened, and I could feel long chipped fingernails digging into me. Don't listen. Tears began to slide down my face, and I felt the hand traveling down from my shoulder to my chest. It began to push into me, working its way into pulling the skin away. I felt the pain electrify my body. Love. A silly want. A stupid decision. I could feel its breath now, the edges of chapped lips against my ears it screamed. It's not real. It's not human. Then I felt a squeeze. My heart felt like Play-Doh being smashed into the ground. Its hand was in my chest. It was holding on for dear life. I can taste a loss. My body was almost convulsing, but I kept my hands on the wheel, wheezing and crying as whatever was behind me traced its tongue over my earlobe. Pop. The noise was the most cringe-inducing sound I'd ever heard, loud and proudly grotesque. I looked down toward the source of the noise, my chest, and watched the mystery hand pull out my heart. 
except it wasn't my heart. It was a cluster of spiders, all muddled together with legs kicking aimlessly. I looked back at the road and vomited over the steering wheel, my hands and part of the windshield. Then I heard more voices, screaming and overlapping each other. They screamed obscenities. They begged me to make a U-turn. They said things about myself I never knew I hated. And then my car began to slow. The hand was gone. My headlights flickered lazily. And the car was silent. I'll never hear silence like this again, I thought. Mile 8 Alex stood at the side of the road, a hand raised to me in a lopsided smile. I kept on going, and Alex disappeared and then reappeared. No matter where I looked, he was there, completely taking over every part of the road. I couldn't close my eyes. Whatever had infiltrated me during the game would not allow it. It was hours, an endless loop of Alex, never moving, never changing, until around hour three. Alex was still there, but now he was crying whilst motioning with his arms for me to pull over. He changed again on the fourth hour. He was distressed now. His face seemed tortured in it. It was covered in blood. His eye was hanging by tendrils from his socket and oozing a black goo. He had a sign now with the number four written in blood. I heard him calling my name. Hour after hour, I heard him call out for me, and hour after hour, I had to stop myself from throwing myself out of a moving car. After what felt like almost a full day of driving, and hearing Alex's voice, something inside of me died. My mind short-circuited, my very soul simply stopped. The game had taken the very last of me. My bones ached with relief. No matter what happened next, I knew that the game couldn't hurt me anymore because nothing mattered. Nothing mattered. Then, just like me, my car suddenly died too. Mile 9 I screwed my eyes shut and felt the car sputter as I restarted it. I felt the car hurtling forward almost instantly. Stop the car! It was Alex's voice. I kept driving. Lily, please stop the car. Stop the car and get the hell out. It's not what it seems. Another tear trickled down my face. Lily, stop. Oh God, Lily, you're going to hit me. He was screaming through sobs. He was pleading, but I couldn't listen. His body collided into my windshield and I heard every bone crack. It's not what it seems. It's not real. It's not real. It's not real. I could picture his body in my head, twisted and bloody on the road. I kept driving, leaving him alone in the cold. No one to find him. No one to help him. It's not real. 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 He's dead, Lily. This time, the voice was Neville's, and it was not mocking or cruel. Even through the twang of his usual static hiss, it was calm, almost kind. No matter what, Lily, he's dead. He was dead long before you played this stupid game. Your Alex is not coming back for you. The car shook, hitting a pothole. I bit the inside of my cheek. I felt a hand rest gently on my knee. His desire was never you. The hand gave me what I felt was meant to be a reassuring squeeze, but instead it made my body shudder. Lily... He never wanted you. He didn't even make it past the fourth mile. He's nothing but a shadow on the road. Mile 10 I opened my eyes and looked to the passenger side. There was no one there. I was alone. The road ahead was empty, but I knew they were back. The shadows. They were walking beside my car. I was not afraid. They did not want to harm me. They were guiding me home making sure I got to mile 11. The game was coming to a close, and I felt as if the road had become bored of me. I didn't react when I felt something begin to violently kick my seat. I knew it would be over soon. It didn't matter. Nothing mattered. My phone rang and I answered. I was mechanical now, a barely functioning robot. 
Neville's voice was low and for the first time sounded human. You've got this now, kid. This is it. I hope you enjoy your prize. Thanks for the call. Neville sighed before speaking to me again. Lily, unless you're panicked, this is not that fun anymore. Goodbye, Neville. I hung up and kept driving. I was clean and dry. Physically, there was no lasting effects and I felt a weak smile spread across my face as I drove into the final mile. Mile 11. The car rattled, all power dying but the car kept moving. Traffic lights appeared and I let my eyes close. I knew there would be a red light. I smelt the smoke before I felt the fire. Flames licked at my body but there was no pain. The exhaustion washed over me in a wave and my body became limp. It was over. The car was going to keep moving. If I died, at least I would be with Alex. Voices came back now, but they weren't cruel like they had been before. They were... They were celebrating. They were congratulating me. I heard Neville's voice through the tangle of all the others, and I heard it loud and clear. It's not what it seems. No place like home. I still cannot tell you how strangely calm the car ride became. I was back at the beginning of the road, eyes wide open and knowing something wasn't right. I'd survived the road. I was back to my own world, my own reality. I closed my eyes once more, tightly enough to make pain shoot across my brow. I pictured Alex. I pictured falling into his arms. I pictured him happy and smiling and alive. I pictured him gazing at me adoringly. The rest of the night was a blur. I got home to find my sister passed out in my spare bed. I checked the time on my phone and smirked when I saw the time. 11 p.m. For a few seconds, I felt my brain trying to process the journey I'd been on, which had most definitely been, or at least felt like days. But then tiredness washed over me. I kissed my sister's forehead and crawled into bed beside her. I wrapped my arms around her tightly, kissing her again, this time on the top of the head. I was home. I was safe. I woke up to the shrill ringing of my phone. My sister's voice was hushed as she spoke. Lily, I'm so sorry I got called into work really early. I didn't want to wake you, but I realized that if I didn't, you'd probably be like, so confused. I sat up and stretched my arms out. My joints clicked pleasantly in response. What do you mean? Well, last night Alex was banging on the door like crazy. Alex? I jumped out of bed, my dog following suit. Yeah, his car broke down on the way back to his and, and said you were, you were closest. I told him to just stay in your bed. Why he didn't use his key, I don't know. Anyway, I gotta go. Love you. The phone went dead as my sister rushed to return to her work. Of course she let him in. She hadn't known he was missing. Alex was alive. I stood at the doorway of my bedroom and saw Alex curled up in my bed, blankets piled high over his body. Alex! He shot up, his eyes locking onto mine. Lily! He clutched his chest and fell back into the bed. You gave me a heart attack. Sorry for just showing up. You wouldn't believe the last few days. But before he could finish his sentence... I had thrown myself on top of him. I sobbed into his chest. My entire body was heaving into his. He rubbed my back and attempted to soothe me as best he could. Alex called his family and friends. He told them they were mistaken. He'd gone wild camping and screwed up. I watched as he laughed with them, apologized to them, and walked around my house as he spoke without a care in the world. Once he was done with his explanations, he sat next to me, holding my hand tightly. Did you play the game? My voice was quiet and shaky. Alex raised an eyebrow. I don't really know what you're on about, babe. His voice was sickly sweet, but his face. My heart sank because I finally saw it. How could I have missed it? On Alex's forehead, ever so faintly, was a number four with a line through it. I continued to stare at him, studying his face closely, and saw what looked to be an old scar just underneath his eye. Alex had never had a scar. He kissed me then, 
fall on the mouth and I kissed him back. For a moment, that golden glow from the road filled me again. But then as he broke our kiss with a smile, I felt like one of the sunflowers I watched die. I'm going to get a bubble bath running for you. You look tired. He walked off, shooting me a wink as he did. So, this is the part when you all send me congratulations and rejoice that I won the game. I got top prize. Thing is, this isn't Alex. The man who is at this current time lying next to me snoring away is not Alex. He looks like him, sounds like him, and hell, he's got the laugh down too, but it's not Alex. The Alex I went looking for never loved me. We had a fleeting moment once in his car, hot and sweaty, but when we spoke about it, we found it meant different things to each of us. He was lonely and well, I was there and willing. He got a girlfriend and began to leave me behind. He pushed me out when I admitted drunkenly at the start of his new relationship that I was in love with him. I'll never know why he played the game. I'll never speak to him again. Alex is dead. I got what I wanted, an Alex who loves me, but it's just not what it seems. I can't live like this. Goodbye, guys. I've got a new road to take. Thank you for making it this far. I'd like to encourage you to subscribe if you like my content. If you'd like to follow me and want to be involved in what I'm doing slash talk to me, follow me on Twitter or Instagram. If you'd like an offline experience, check out the podcast, The Midnight Podcast. And if you're at all inclined, I've got some merch out there to be purchased if you'd like to support the channel. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you in the next video.